Right, because <laughs> how would you know? Like, it's not like we send up a flare. Right, I never say, hey, we're rolling now. Right, exactly. So it's kind of a sneaky thing. Do we want to reintroduce it, or will you just pull from... Um, no, we should probably do an actual introduction. Actual yeah, what do we do on this podcast, Ben? This podcast? I'm, I'm asking you because... Oh, this audio recording of, of a podcast. podcast. Because this is not a podcast. Right, I'm asking you because I've forgotten... Really? What this show is about. I'm surprised to hear that you've forgotten. Yeah, well, because you, you've, you've edited every single I've episode edited of this podcast. so much, I upload them, I do, you know, a lot of the menial grunt work. I've researched and recorded episodes, but it's really escaped me. I see that the dementia <laughs> is finally setting in. Yeah, well, that's offensive to the Alzheimer's community, <laughs> Ben, so. Well, we've offended every other demographic Just on this podcast careful. so far. Not, what we do, not true, not true. There's a few uh, small groups. I'm sure we'll come across their Wikipedia articles at some point. Do you like Germans? 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 Uh, well, I don't think we've offended any Germans yet. Well, today's your lucky day. Great. <laughs> Excellent. Fantastic. This is a podcast where we uh, talk about obscure things. Yeah. And that's pretty much the gist that's, of it. That's about it. I'm you, Ben. I'm Thomas. We have a special guest host today, which we're really excited about. Yeah, Our yeah. first ever guest hosted episode. Indeed. So if you're just joining us for the first time, uh, this is not a typical episode. Yeah. It's very special. It's probably much better than a typical episode. Definitely. So well, don't calibrate your expectations based on this episode alone. Definitely. Definitely take a random sampling. My recommendation is listen to all the episodes before you decide you don't like the podcast and want to un unsubscribe forever. Definitely. Although, even in that case, unsubscribing is probably not recommended because right. new episodes are coming out all the time, right. which may add to that opinion. Yeah. Unless you're listening to this from the far-flung future after we're all dead and America's gone. and Right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to introduce yourself and describe your... Uh, I thought you were introducing me, but then you started talking about how you should subscribe. Okay. Stay subscribing. Uh, that is true. Go oh, ahead. wait. Did you want him to introduce himself or you, me? You were no, sort of... I was not talking... When I was making eye contact uh, with Jesse uh -huh. and saying things specifically for him to right. do, I wasn't speaking to you, Ben. Okay. Sorry. It's just hard to remember that the world is not all about me. Right. Yes. So... So, go, well, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, introduce yourself. So, okay. Well, um, I'm Jesse, so I'm Ben's younger brother. And I have a special World War I treat for all of you. Treat. Treat. Yes. Treat. Yes. Treat disease. It's treat nice, disease. Treat disease. It's a nice treat. It's not a technically treat disease. It's just a treat. So, uh, the topic is the SMS Emden, which is a actually... Um, a topic that when Ben first introduced me to Obscure Origami, because I am one of three listeners, way back... We're up to four now. Oh, you're up to four? Yes. Yes. Probably. Shall we pause for an awkward applause? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we succeeded in the awkwardness. And killed all the mosquitoes yes. in the room. Anyway, back to the SMS what? Emden. Text, so the, is this like a text message? A text message. Yeah, an SMS. I'm a lewd at it. I have a flip phone. I don't know what that actually means. Oh. <laughs> what does it, SMS stand to me, for? Then. Oh, yeah. oh, this is. That is a good start. question. It is actually. I need to look that up. It's German. It's a German. It's naval... like USS. Right. But it's uh, German, standing for the Kaiserschmarine, which is the Navy. Uh, somehow the Germans make very weird acronyms because they don't usually make that much sense. Um, if you actually look at the word that it's standing for. So not a text message. Well, that's fine. No, it's not a text message. It's a, a warship named after a small town uh, in East Frisia, which is the northern part of Holland, where Germany kind of meets. And uh, it uh, it's actually was built up in Danzig, which was a, a famous city. Of course, all that's boring, and nobody really cares about that, but I find that fascinating. <laughs> so this is actually called the Swan of the East which is sort of the, the poetic name of the, the ship before the First World War actually began, after which it was called the Kaiser's Pirate Ship. Hmm. And basically uh, what happened was it took the entire Indian Ocean by storm and pretty much held the entire industry of the British shipping. So the SMS Emden 
was part of the German East Squ- East Asian Squadron, um, which was about five ships. As uh, there's a famous um, quote in uh, Black Adder where the main character goes. So the German Empire is includes about a German a sausage factory off in China, and the British Empire includes all of Africa and the quarter of the globe. That's basically what the German Empire was. It was a sausage factory in Tsingtao. I do not know if I pronounced that right, but I just sort of went with it. After the Boxer Rebellion in the really early 1900s, in 1901, uh, 1902, the end of the Victorian age, the Germans, and actually the Austrians too, but the Germans had sent troops and actually managed to gain a port town called Tsingtao. Out of that, they based off a few ships, including the SMS Emden, which was mm-hmm. this obsolete warship that was built actually in the 1900s. Um, it was actually decommissioned and actually recommissioned as they saw the First World War coming up and they decided to strengthen the, specifically they sent it to go and strengthen the East Asian Squadron, which is under the command of Grandmal von Spee. Um, A Star Wars character. Yes. Uh, actually, Grand. Um, Commander Maximilian von Spee um, was actually kind of an interesting figure in his own right because he realized that Tsing Tao was not tenable because they had four ships and the British Empire was coming at them and they were going to lose their sausage factory very quickly. So what they did is they decided to make a run for it all the way up to Europe. So they went down the coast of all the way up to South America and they actually ran into a British squadron about the same size. These squadrons literally are four ships to four ships. And they actually destroyed the British fleet, or detachment rather, and continued on until they were completely um, surprised by a much larger British fleet in the Falkland Islands. So they actually made it all the way to the Falkland Islands before they were completely annihilated. And where was their starting point again? To Sing Tao. So okay. if you look at a map, it's uh, actually a very strategic port mm-hmm. because it's um, if you have Beijing, there's a harbor or a bay, rather, that comes up, uh, leading all the way up to Beijing. Mm-hmm. That's where Korea and China, that's what gives Korea its peninsula, mm-hmm. um, and the distinctive shape of China. And Tsingtao is another peninsula that comes off of China that meets Korea. It doesn't quite reach to Korea, mm-hmm. but Tsingtao is on that peninsula, so it's a strategic entrance to that harbor, mm-hmm. or bay, rather. Before Grand Mouth, um, I think that's his title, Grand Mouth, Anyway, Maximilian von Spee decides to go for that route, and he decides to go for Germany. There's one captain, a man by the name of Müller, who is the captain of a small, light cruiser called the SMS Emden. Um, And he decides, you know what? That is a stupid plan. We're all going to die. So what is he going to do? He decides to go and attack Allied shipping in the Indian Ocean. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, keep in mind, this is the age of coal. So the thing about the uh, the Emden is it's not that impressive a ship. It really isn't. Um, it has a 23, 24-knot top speed, which is not that fast, but it can really only go 12 knots to maintain any form of um, range because, after all, it's based off of coal. Right. And there's not really a whole lot of neutral shipping in because remember, they're at war with Britain, France, and Russia, which are the three most powerful navies in the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. Mm-hmm. So they don't really have too many places to stop and get coal. Right. So do they maintain their fuel supply by stealing from other ships? That's where it gets interesting. They have one small ship that mm-hmm. is, acts as uh, an auxiliary ship that has coal. Um, and they actually run into, within a week, within a week of learning that the war has started, mm-hmm. they already capture a Russian ship called the Ryazan, which is, they sort of create as an auxiliary cruiser in order to reinforce their coal-carrying capacity. So already he's created this small fleet within a week. And then it gets crazy. By the end of his entire um, episode that lasts about a year, he's captured something of like, uh, I forget the exact number, different accounts always give different numbers. Um, because a lot of the ships that he captured, he also released. Others he sank, and so sometimes it's not easy to tell exactly how many ships he either sank or captured. But there was at least 20. Wow. By his lonesome. 20. Yeah. By himself. One ship. In a wow. year. 
It's it's quite amazing. With an uh, average speed of about twelve knots. Right. <laughs> going through <laughs> the Indian o- going through the Indian Ocean <laughs> right. at a time where Britain controlled you know, you've always heard Britannia rules of waves. Mm-hmm. They also controlled all of India. Right. Also Australia. And also Japan entered the war. So it's it's, it's an amazing story. So what was the, the secret to his success? What is, was his strategy that enabled him to be so successful? Mostly audacity. So what happens was he goes up and he captures this... He comes up to this um, Greek ship. And he's... By the rules of the law, um, there is... Before the war, there's this thing called the Hay Convention, which is basically a... Uh, rules of engagement on the sea. Mm -hmm. And Captain Von Mueller is actually a very, very honorable man. And he's, for instance, if he captures a ship, he will capture a second ship and he'll put all the prisoners on the second ship, especially if he finds a neutral ship. There's an Italian ship before the Italians entered the war. There's an American ship also before we entered the war. And there's also a Greek ship, which is a little different. There's a Greek ship with a long Greek name that I won't try to pronounce. Um, that he comes up to, and under the Hague Convention, he is legally bound or legally able to take the property on that ship because they are going to sell coal to the British Empire, Mm -hmm. but he doesn't. Instead, he actually hires the ship as another collier. So he's already got three coal ships. Mm -hmm. So he's building this fleet slowly by himself. Mm -hmm. He's only got one warship. But the cleverest thing that he does is because they realized that it, his ship is actually kind of famous. Because, mm-hmm. um, you know, people in Hong Kong, for instance, actually already know him pretty well. In fact, there's actually one article that I read about that I'll put on the, the show notes that was talking about how people in Hong Kong, which was a British colony at the time, actually were very reluctant when the First World War happened because their best friends were German. There's this funny story where they're all sitting down to a dinner and then two days later, they're all at war. <laughs> they're like, well, gee, this sucks. So they sort of like, well, they get new, uh, an order from the top to say, oh, we're going to arrest all the merchants in Hong Kong. Like, oh, yeah, we're not going to do that. But um, in Hong Kong is where the Emden gets its name, the, the Swan of the East, because it's mm-hmm. sort of seen as this elegant ship even though it's completely obsolete and it is really outgunned and outmatched and outpaced by everything on the water at that point. Yeah. Now, forgive me, was Hong Kong a British territory at this point? It was a British colony all the way up until 1990s. Okay. Which was kind of an unfortunate event when the uh, Highlanders got a full win. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was actually kind of an international incident there, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> was, yes, one of those funny, obscure stories. They don't wear beneath the kilt, in case you're wondering. But the Emden, um, what he does, Captain Von Mueller, he has, the ship has three stacks, three coal stacks. So he decides, you know, his ship looks kind of similar to this English ship called the Yarmouth, or the Yarmouth, I don't know how you pronounce that, um, which has four stacks. So he adds a fake stack to the end. Oh, I've heard of this. Have you? Yeah, no, that that's I I've I don't remember obviously any of the other details surrounding the story, but I've heard that's of fair. this particular um I'm also starting very slow. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he builds a fourth dummy stack on right. the back of his ship in order to sail past the British. Uh-huh. And so he terrorizes he, you know, he's he's a typical commerce raider for the first couple of weeks. Mhm. Um, there's actually a long history of commerce raiding. Um, the U.S. actually was big in commerce raiding because, you know, we're also fighting a much larger fleet. Mm-hmm. Um, that's basically the basic idea behind the whole U-boat campaign in the Atlantic. But, they, of course, they didn't have U-boats, so he's going with a small cruiser. Right. right. Um, commerce raiding sounds like a very, like, PC government term for pirating. Well, it's not technically pirating, actually. They call it... Um, as sort of a, a derogatory term, they call it the Kaiser's pirate ship, but it's mm-hmm. not technically a pirate ship because there's a very clear definition between pirate, privateer, and commerce raiding because he is a member of the German Navy. 
A pirate is somebody who has no affiliation with the government. Right. A privateer is a pirate hired by the government. And a commerce raider <laughs> is somebody who just happens to be fighting ships from a foreign hostile power while being a member of your own navy and wearing the uniform. Right. Gotcha. It, there's very clear-cut distinctions between them. Yeah. So it's not really fair to call them a pirate, even though people actually kind of did. But that was really more because they were mad at him. Right. It's kind of, mili- it's like specifically militarized pirating, but it's not like they're just boating around. Well, commerce raiding is war. Right. I mean, it's... it's Piracy implies yeah. a... Uh... Piracy is theft. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's the definition. This, yeah, is, that, this is, is theft for the purposes of war. But that was a, that's what I was getting yeah, at. Is like the like distinction forging. the di- the distinction is one is associated one is associated with a government, and it's exactly it's a specific aggressive act. The other is just like a free agent who it's it, yeah. I guess it's the same. It's the same as not calling what soldiers do murder. Mm-hmm. Like right, we don't call them murderers because they are an agent of the state. Yeah, right. But that's not technically murder. Yeah. They are killing other people. But, but functionally, they're kind of performing it's not the technically same tasks. Murder. Right. Yes. Also on a much larger scale sometimes. Although right. piracy technically yeah. is grand theft sh- right. shipping. Grand theft shipping. <laughs> this is basically what it is. It's grand theft shipping. <laughs> Three, or whatever number you want to put it. Or technically mm-hmm. one, I guess, because it's the First World War. Yeah. Ah. Anyways. Grand theft shipping one. You heard it here first. Uh, exactly. The San Indian Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> so you know it seems like a, a pretty typical commerce raider though you know he's got his own stack and um most of the british don't actually realize that he's even there for a while and then he starts wrapping up the pace and he starts capturing another ship and another ship and another ship right so what did the british think were, was happening well they quickly their... realized because yeah. as i was just about to say there's actually an italian ship that mm-hmm. he stopped and did something similar to the Greek ship, the Porto Porto Um I can't pronounce it. It's <laughs> it's like twelve letters long. Um, <laughs> but the Italian ship, well, the Italians had actually just broken an alliance up with the Germany, and it was pretty clear that the Italians might actually enter the Allies. Both Germany and the Allies were fighting over Italy, trying to get, enter the war. Mm-hmm. And so the Italians, kind of not liking the Germans, decided to go over to. Um, um, the British Empire up in India, which is their original plowing, and they just say, yeah, there's the ship out there, and we think it's the SMS Emden, which actually technically breaks their neutrality. idea of neutrality. It breaks their neutrality. So they're technically entering as a belligerent, even though it's it's technical, so it doesn't actually happen. Right. So what... And this is where it gets crazy... He decides to, um, you know, he captures another ship, um, the Trabok. Uh, he, he captures several other ships. And this is where it gets really interesting. He decides he's had enough of just capturing a ship or two. So he decides to go and attack Madras, which is a city of several hundred thousand people. And at Madras is one of the largest um, deposits of oil in all of British India. And the British are already familiar with these that he's there. They've sent out several ships to go and hunt him, about six, um, which is not that many. By the end of his career, they've sent out about 20, and it'll be like a multinational effort <laughs> to hunt this one ship down in the Indian <laughs> Ocean. <laughs> it gets a little crazy. Um, and then he sort of accidentally gets found, but we'll get to there. Um, and so he sails into Madras, and there's a, the British basically told all their citizens to black out the coast so he can't see the coast. Mm-hmm. And uh, one chronicler reported it as being lit up by a Christmas tree because they evidently they didn't pay attention to the order. So he knew exactly <laughs> what he was shooting at. So he goes up to into the town and he completely raises one of the largest oil fields in all of India overnight mm-hmm. and sails away and the British aren't on the wiser. Which is problematic. Yeah. Yeah. Now they're mad. Um, so Winston Churchill, who is the, the first sealer, goes, well, this sucks. So he said, so he, the Russians and the French all kind of get together. And this is when the, the really they really start ramping up and trying to find him. 
And then in, this is actually the period where he sinks the most ships. Um, let's see. After Madras, he sank the Timeric near Ceylon. Madras, I think, is up in the, the north. So it's sort of along the, um, the eastern coast. Not quite up to Calcutta, but sort of about halfway, I think. I would need to double check that, but I'm pretty sure that's around where that is. My geography is right. Uh, but I'm American, what do I know? He captures the Grey Fabal, which is an interesting name, um, and uses that as a prison ship. So that was the thing about Mahler, his he didn't execute his prisoners, he didn't hold them for ransom. He's got this tiny ship that's about 100 meters long. So he's not going to yeah. have room for that. So right. a lot of the times he just sends them off. Um, this is one of the ships that he sends them off on. So half the ships that he actually captures, he just sends and basically gives them back because he can't hold them. Right. The others he sinks and puts the prisoners on the next ship. Do you think Do you think that has anything to do with his ability to kind of skate by on his own for a while because he's not being weighed down by uh, these... Oh, definitely. ...ships that he's... You definitely, know, he yeah. is just kind of like... Yeah. Hit and run, hit and run. Yeah. And staying light. Yeah. And then he also... Um, there's another ship too. And there, he he gets another ship, but one of the craziest things is he gets on October 9th. I'm kind of looking at some of these dates here. He goes to this place called Diego Garcia, which is actually a British colony, despite the Spanish name. And the funny thing is, Diego Garcia doesn't realize the First World War started. <laughs> so they offer to take care of his ship. They actually give it a fresh coat of paint. <laughs> they repaint the ship. <laughs> They give a new coal. Uh, in fact, there's um, as a repayment, Mueller sends half of his crew to rebuild like the. I think it's the governor's yacht. So they rebuild and repatch the uh, governor's yacht, and then they go off. How did he know that this guy didn't know that the war had started? Well, I mean, was he just kind of taking there, a gamble and he sailed into port and he's like, "Hi." Well, he was actually going there in order to raid it. Ah, and he gets And then there. he realized, and he decided not to take advantage of them. This is why, so he's like, you know what, I'm just going to sit here and just not tell them. Sort of like a don't ask, don't tell sort of situation. Right. It's like, you know, we won't so, tell you that the war started because they don't have a telegram there. They don't have any access to the outside communication because it's a colony of about 100 people off mm -hmm. in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Nobody thought to tell Diego Garcia. Most people don't even know where Diego Garcia is on the map. So they just, just go, okay, well... You know, some of our colleagues may not know, but what's the chance that a German ship's going to fly into or sail into one of these colonies? And lo and behold. And lo and behold. Lo and, behold. and lo and behold. Swan of the East. And then he sinks the Clam Grant, the Pond Rabble, the Bonmore, the Trollis, the Chilvacana, and he captures the Exford over the next couple of days. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> this guy is uh, pretty uh, kickatus butticus. This is a regular uh, Gregor McGregor of the Sea. This, pretty much. this is the Gregor McGregor of the Seas. Only a little more honorable and a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. More, he it, he did actual things. Yes. Yeah. Gregor McGregor just lied a bunch and collected money. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why we love him. Right. <laughs> so then he decides to attack another Indian city. Uh -huh. which is called Penang. And there's this whole thing about the Battle of Penang where he sails in and there's he's expecting heavy resistance because there's supposed to be two French heavy cruisers there. He's a light cruiser. These mm -hmm. are large, heavy, giant cruisers. But he's hoping to outmaneuver them? Well, I don't actually know what he's hoping there. <laughs> um, but luck sort of... Favors he's, him. He's getting a little cocky at this point, I think. He's but like, Luck favors him. He's and there's only little... one light Russian cruiser. Oh, well, there you go. But the thing about the Russian cruiser is <laughs> it's it's a mess. There's stuff all over the deck. There is only six rounds of ammunition in each gun, one of which is chambered. And according to legend, I don't know if this is true, but there's a funny story of how he the Russian captain's with his mistress and uh, sort of <laughs> looks up without his uh, trousers on to see his ship aflame. And uh, it's, it's a bad day for him. He's actually, actually after the, the war ends, he goes back to Russia. He's court-martialed, fined, and thrown into prison for six years for <laughs> negligence. 
<laughs> yeah. So that ship's done. Uh, <laughs> and, like, and then while coming out, you know, he sort of bombs the city for a little bit and he comes out and uh, there's a, a French light cruiser which tries to run um, because he's actually outgunned. It's like one of the first times the Emden's ever outgunned. So the Emden actually opens fires and completely destroys it. But Mahler once again shows himself as being a noble guy and fishes out the few survivors of the, um, the ship and puts it back on shore. So he's one of those guys who it, he's seen by a lot of people as one of the last people with the, the gallantry of the seas. Because there's sort of a, a gentleman's code of conduct in, in warfare, mm -hmm. which the Great War, the First World War, is known for not having. Because you yeah. have the U-boat campaign, you have, the, of course, the, the Western Front. Um, and he, and actually also a couple of other German commanders in the colonial era, um, are fascinating because they they're sort of uphold that, that old tradition of gallantry mm -hmm. of the old imperial era. Um, but it, it sounds like he uses some modern techniques, too. As far as his strategy, well, like being lightweight and hit and run, and that seemed more uh, a necessity. Yeah, it is really guess, more of a necessity. I yeah. mean, it's not really necessarily as modern as you might think if you mm -hmm. study more military history, mm -hmm. but it's it is a modern concept um, because the whole First World War was sort of a machine-driven enterprise. Um, and at the end of the day, I wouldn't exactly say that the whole campaign of the Emden really was a machine-driven enterprise. It was really more of a man-driven enterprise, which would made it really unique in the war. Because you have machine guns and the artillery and the big Bertha, and, um, which is a big piece of artillery. Um, barbed wire, trenches, and all this machine. But instead, with the Emden, you have more of the traditional... Um, sort of uh, crazy audacity yeah. of a lot of people One which guy, built the yeah. old empires, for better or for worse. Right. He's the he's the German uh, Sergeant York of the sea. Exactly. <laughs> he just, he goes in there and he's ambitious. and Exactly. So what finally brought him down? Ah, I'm getting to Or that, did he yeah. get brought down? He did actually get brought down. Mm. Yes. Kind of ironically. So he's... Traveling, and he's um, goes to these islands called the Caucasus Islands, and uh, there's a strategic telegram station right there. So he decides to or there's a, a telegram station there. So he decides to go and take the station out. So he goes up to it, and most of what he when he comes up to another ship, what he says he fires a, a warning shot over the bow and says, "Full stop." And um, don't use the wireless. Well, he does basically the same thing. He lands about 50 men. The crew is about 346 people. I say about, but 346 people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so he lands about 50 people, about 50 people, onto the small island. And the Germans are at the gates when one brave Australian decides, you know what, I'm going to send a telegram regardless. So he sends a telegram, and it reaches the British well, the British only have one ship in the area, so they send this one ship that's really unprepared called the HMAS Sydney. Now, the HMAS stands for His Majesty's Australian Ship. So it's an Australian ship that they have going. <laughs> this is, the Australians have never won a naval battle before this, ever. <laughs> I want to point that out. Not even an engagement or anything. Ever. <laughs> so the Sydney goes, and there's actually this funny story about... Um, I found this one article about, the, it's the, the doctor's locks. And he was writing, um, and he, he, before he started listing all the casualties from the battle, he wrote, and the bathrooms were just repainted, and so there's nothing actually there. So all the stuff is, again, kind of haphazard and a mess because they weren't expecting action. Regardless, though, it's bigger. It's faster, it's more heavily armed, it's got more guns, and most importantly, it has the drop, on the, for the first time, it has the drop on the SMS Endon, who has about, what, sixth, a seventh of its crew on the small little island? So it gets into this long engagement, but the Endon is 
outranged. So most of its shots fall short, fall long, or completely miss, or just bounce off the Sydney. The Sydney keeps coming, and the Emden starts burning and starts taking on water. So what Muller decides to do is, without much choice, he decides to beach it. And there's a sandbar where the wreck actually remained for a long time. He, he parks, not really parks, but sort of crashes the boat <laughs> onto the sandbar. And unfortunately, nobody took down the colors. So this, the, the captain of the Sydney just sort of looks at it and goes, well, I guess he's still trying to fight. So he bombards it, and that's where about 100 and some of his men are killed. On the, the Emden. So he's got, he's lost about half his men. Another seventh of his men is back on the, the island. So he strikes the colors, and that's the, the end of the Emden. But it gets more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the, the, the healthy crew is taken all the way up to Malta. They're kind of through a long, arduous stretch, and they go back to Malta, including the captain, Captain von Müller. Mm-hmm. And he's finally, after the war, goes back and retires um, peacefully. He doesn't write a book or anything about it. He's sort of regarded to to a lot of fanfare because the Emden sort of captures the German imagination. But he doesn't, he sort of goes back into obscurity. Um, He actually joins the party that became the forerunner of the party that became the party that became the Nazis. Which is not actually connected to the Nazis, but I thought that was interesting. He died in like 1923 or something. Um, but he, he was sort of a nationalist to his end. His dad was um, a career Prussian military colonel. Um, so he was, he, was, he was from a long tradition of um, Prussian military pride. Um, some of his wounded crew, though, is taken to Singapore. And they are put into a prison... And this little thing happens where the Indian soldiers in Singapore actually rise up in revolt against the British. So what the Germans do is they, in this weird event, they actually fight with the British, protecting the British civilians at Singapore against the uprising Indian soldiers. <laughs> hmm. When did this revolt take place? 1950. Okay. So all this actually happened in the first year of the war. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but... One of the most interesting things, though, is not actually about the Emden. It's about that expeditionary force that was left on the Caucasus Islands. Because the Australians didn't realize they were there. And they left, completely leaving them there. <laughs> so then they go, well, we're stuck on a long-forgotten island off in the middle of the Polynesian Islands. We're in the South Pacific now. He's gone all the way from Tsingtao near Beijing down to the Indian coast all the way to um, east of Australia in the South Pacific. Um, and then so the guy whose name was Helmuth von Mook, he's the lieutenant, he's the second in command, the, the executive officer that XO of the Emden. He goes, well, there's this old sailing ship here in port that used to take goods, but if you thought the Emden was obsolete, this ship was very much obsolete. So this old three mast ship, it's got four, uh, tanks to capture rainwater. Three of them are contaminated and four of them don't really work that well. So he's got one that doesn't really work that well. The wood is sort of getting rotten because it's just basically been sitting there and basically the Capricorn um, South Pacific heat. Um, So he decides, okay, I'm going to sail north, see what happens. So they all climb into this boat and they start sailing away. And they get to a neutral port. I think it was a, a Dutch port. I think it was Batavia. Um, but under the the same convention, the Hague Convention, they only have 24 hours to be there. So they get water, they get food, and then they leave. Miracle upon miracles, they run into one of the few German ships in the entire Pacific and Indian Oceans, which happens to be a merchant ship. So they have taken, and the merchant ship just sort of unceremoniously drops them off in your men. <laughs> and so they're in Aden. They go, well, Aden's the, the port, major port city up to Sanana, the capital of Yemen. So they decided, okay, well, let's march up to Constantinople and take the, the, the land route, which was actually one of the major 
reasons for the First World War was the the Germans wanted to re- build a, a railroad down to Constantinople, which went through Serbia. Problems arose. Archduke Franz Ferdinand, all that good stuff. Um, so they decided to march up, and then they get attacked by Bedouins. <laughs> so weirdly, we are started in Tsing Tao, and now we're talking about Lawrence of Arabia. Because these are the same Bedouins. And the, in uh, his memoirs, Von Mook actually mentions, I bet these Bedouins are supported by the British. It's actually the Bedouins who are supported by Lawrence of Arabia. Oh, wow. And so he actually gets into, he's in the Hejaz. So he, he again, he sort of uh, is saved by the emir of Mecca. And he's like, oh, we're finally saved by an ally. Then after a while, a couple of days go by, he goes, you know, the emir of Mecca is going to use us for political bargaining chips, isn't he? Probably right. We will never know, though, because in the middle of the night, without telling anybody, he steals a couple of boats and starts sailing up the Red Sea up to Egypt. <laughs> he manages to get all the way up to the Red Sea, goes all the way up to Constantinople, comes back to this great fanfare up in Germany where he, he ends his career. He actually is the person who actually wrote a book about the Emden, mm-hmm. which was in German, so I didn't read it. Um, and then he also wrote a second book called the... Um, I need to look that name up because it was sort of a weird name. The Ayesha, which is the name of that three-masted vessel. So it's a story about the, the commerce raiding of the Emden back mm-hmm. in the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. And then also about his journey back home. And so he's the one who we really know the most about the whole expedition. But the legacy of the Emden is is also incredible. Because the Australians, this is the first naval victory of the Australian fleet. <laughs> As far as I know, it's the only victory of the Australian fleet, but we we won't go there. So the Australian War Museum has everything you want to know about the Emden. So if you ever go to Sydney or Canberra or any of the major museums in Australia, look up the SMS Emden. They they have their anchor, they have their cannons, they have everything. In fact, actually, it doesn't actually ever really, the entire wreck is actually, parts are still there. You'll go into the Pacific and you'll see pieces of metal still floating apart. Wow. Um, but most of it is washed away. There was a uh, one World War II soldier who actually said, "Oh, look, there's the Emden. <laughs> Just past the Emden, which is a, a famous ship." It's so famous that the German Navy has actually named three other ships by it. They've made three different movies, which, as two history buffs or movie buffs, you would both probably enjoy if you like German movies in German language. Um, and one of them, the last one, which was in 2012, was actually produced talking about. The Last 50. I think it was called something like Those Who Were Left Behind by the Emden or something similar to that. <coughs> the craziest thing, though... <laughs> the craziest thing, though, is the name Emden has actually gotten in, into two native Indian languages. One... Uh, let me look up which ones they were so I get my languages right. This story is like the gift that keeps on giving. (laughs) Oh, it just keeps going. (laughs) There's just a layer after layer of intrigue and obscureness. So, in colloquial Sinhala, which is a language, so-and-so is a real Emden. The E pronounced as an A as an And, so that would be Amden. Um, Would mean a crafty person, cunning as a fox, which makes sense. And then... (laughs) Where is this language spoken? Sinhala. It's a, a German language I don't, or an Indian language. I don't really know too much about the language. There's another language where Emden has come to mean great. I am unfortunately didn't write that down in my notes. I should double check that. But the Sri Lankan mothers used to um, scare their unruly children with stories about the Emden. And the Emden man will come and get you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's it really is the gift that keeps on giving. It's a pretty cool boat. <laughs> it is. Or ship, technically. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Ships, not boats. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> a boat is a kayak. A ship is a 100-meter right, right, cruiser. Right, right. <laughs> but the amazing thing is, it's this one of the slowest ships. It's obsolete. It still had a ram. It was so old. <laughs> wow. So, uh, if he knew he was going down, why didn't he use his ram and uh, ram the Australians? He just have been blown to pieces before he. He would have got been blown to pieces. It. The Sydney was also faster than he was. Right. So he couldn't have caught it, and he, he couldn't have been blown to pieces. Yeah, it, it wouldn't have worked. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Wow. One man, and his 
ship and his and ship. 40, one man in his boat and his 340 man crew but <laughs> well yeah they, they don't count right, right, right most of them died anyway so yeah most of them got uh killed or left behind yeah but it's a fascinating story because the germans also view it as sort of one of the few moments of heroism in the first world war right yeah. it's sort of that and another person named Lato von beck paul emil von Lato beck who is actually a colonial commander on land off in East Germany. Those two people are seen as sort of like the, the few heroes of the the German enterprise. Which is, to a lot of Germans, was the fall of the empire. Right. Um, which, of course, after the Versailles Treaty, created that sense of loss and that sense of um, betrayal that a lot of them faced, which, of course, led directly to the Second World War. It's contrary to that. some belief. The First World War was not uh, a battle between Nazis and Communists and that, that was not. <laughs> that was the other one. That was the other one. We're talking about the first one. <laughs> right. Uh, I noticed you didn't mention someone who's famous in American culture, the Red Baron. That is true, yeah, the Red Baron. I was talking most about colonial, right. colonialism, but the Red Baron, of course, was also very famous as an aviator, right. which was also sort of seen as a, a frontier, more technology frontier. Gotcha. But um, he was also the man working with the machine. While well, these right. two people are seen more as the man off in the colonial period. Gotcha. Obviously, yeah. it didn't do a whole lot at the end of the day. Um, sure, it made the British mad. I mean, they they sent, at the end, about 30 ships, 20, 30 ships to, to go and hunt him. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, he fought against the British, the French, the Russians, the even a Japanese ship, I think he actually attacked. Actually, yeah, he sent a couple of Japanese ships. Wow. Yeah, he, uh, he, Izuku or something. Because the Japanese were actually an allied power in the Central, the um, Great War. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> that's, so that was well the story of the entire yeah. German fleet in the Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> so from that sausage factory, great things can happen. So next time you're... Next, next time you're to Sing Tao. Next time somebody's disparaging your sausage factory. Right. Don't let them. Yeah. Moral of the story is, if you're going in somewhere and uh, and you say don't send a telegram don't trust them they're going to send that telegram anyway yeah this and is true it'll this allow is true. especially enemy. australians yeah australians are the only ones who did that apparently because everybody else yeah i didn't think about that that's actually a double australian victory because it was an australian guy that yeah. sent the message and then an australian, I think it was australian ship that came to the rescue i think it was australian yeah. that's a great tale wow which is why the australians really like it <laughs> 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 it's like the North Koreans with that one uh, uh, American. Uh, like they have some kind of the, na the naval little... vessel, American naval vessel, and they like yeah. have oh, yeah. tours through it, yeah. and they're like, "This is, we've uh, <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we had this one, <laughs> we got them." Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, if you think about it, in American um, history, we're all really proud of John Paul Jones captured like three ships. Right. I mean, it wasn't the most impressive commerce raider at the time. In the War of 1812, we actually had a commerce raider of our own called the um, USS Essex, which was fighting actually also in the Indian Ocean um, and also against the British, against the railing industry, and actually completely shut down the British railing industry. Hmm. So commerce raiding can be effective, but most of the time it ends up being the people who take one or two ships and then yeah. get sunk themselves. Things like this, where you add your your ship's name to two different languages and starts creates the <laughs> uh, an image of a boogeyman to all your swilankan kids is rare so once in a lifetime once in a history type thing once in this podcast once once in, once in obscure origami history yeah hmm i like the i like the obscure origami history we're yeah. assembling here we've got yeah. gregor mcgregor and Attu mm -hmm. island and yeah uh cockroach the, milk the emden and <laughs> Cockroach milk is more like cutting edge science, I would say. Yeah, so, definitely. It will uh, be history. It will be history at, at some point. <laughs> Technically, all of this. It will be my domain. Really, uh, you scientists can go. <laughs> really, I'm hoping that the that this podcast itself, sorry, audio recording of a podcast itself is. Yes, if it, we're actually all reading from a um, a script. This right. is actually highly scripted and well thought out. Um, Nobody will believe that if they've listened to an episode of this podcast. 
One day, one day, the obscure gami will be added to many languages as a, mm. as a term meaning uh, incompetence. <laughs> <laughs> Starting with English. <laughs> No, that was that was uh, that was a great topic. That I was felt fantastic, like yeah. uh, I felt like you actually knew what you were talking about, which is more than I can say for Ben and myself. <laughs> Excellent, that agreed. Was- uh, now we have reached the portion of the show where obscure gami also in other native languages means show where hosts click random Wikipedia button and read article that comes hence. Yeah, do you want to do the honors? Uh, I have a Wikipedia page actually open, so yes, I will. Sweet. Here we There's go. There's no internet connection. <laughs> Maybe somebody else should try. Oh, here. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. I never did actually figure out why it's called the Swan of the East. It's such a fascinating, really cool, poetic name, but I never actually figured out why they call what it that. What do swans signify in German culture? Well, it wasn't called that by the, the, oh, Germans. the Germans. It was called that by the Chinese, actually. Oh. Hmm. Before the war, it actually fought um, in two different small rebellions, basically shelled two cities, didn't really do a whole lot. It didn't really have that big of a, a history. It, I think its its biggest moment came when it was an escort ship for Kaiser Wilhelm II. Then it was decommissioned about two days later, so I don't know if that's... Or two months, technically, but... All right, so we've got a real exciting one this week. Uh, cool. S- a man by the name of Simon Hansford. Simon, Hansford. Simon Richard Hansford was born June 3rd, 1963, and uh, he is currently still, oh, still living, still alive, age 54. Great, so uh, we can really offend someone. A Christian minister and moderator elect of the United Uniting Church in Australia. Oh, Australian. Synod of the New South Wales and the ACT. So if you're from down under, this episode is made specifically this, this for you. This episode is dedicated to our boys in, down under. Yes, our, our 0.5 listeners from Australia. Uh Hansford was born in Sydney, son of Barbara and Richard Hansford, maternal grandfather Rupert Grove, who has his own article, uh, whom the Australian Dictionary of Biography states, in the progress towards the union of the Congregational Methodist and Presbyterian churches in Australia, Grove made a decisive impact. (laughs) Wow. This is, uh... Decisive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, there's I don't not... know that much about the history of Australian religious or religious history. M- me neither. Uh, I mean, I know like Virginia, honest. for instance, was an Anglican colony, but I don't know if the, Australia ever had anything like that because it's an, an, an older or a newer colony. Is it fair to say that this article is a stub um, that you can help Wikipedia by expanding? Or what? I don't know that it's a stub. It it seems like it it covers. The, the significance of uh, Simon Hansford uh-huh. quite mm-hmm. thoroughly. Uh, it's very short. The main thing is uh, there doesn't seem to be that much of significance about Simon Hansford. No mm. offense to the man himself. Or any of his relations. Yeah, maybe maybe we can find out more about uh, Uniting Church in Australia, the UCA, mm-hmm. uh, which was established in 1977 most congregations of the Methodist Church of Australasia, about two thirds of the Presbyterian Church of Australia, and almost all the churches in the Congregational Union of Australia came together under the basis of union. So this seems to be some sort of event. Several different so, where several denominations, different denominations uh, came together under one organization. Which is not something that's happened in America. Actually, I think that it I has. Know of. Oh, the Baptist Association. I think it was several Baptist churches came together. Right. Yeah, but they're but, all one do- denomination. But, this is oh, so it's this different denomination. Methodi- yeah, this I this is that. Methodists and Presbyterians. Oh, and uh, other just conglomerated. Uh, huh. Congreg- it is yeah, now congregational union. Conglomeration. Next week's episode on the obscure word conglomerated. That's not actually that obscure, Ben. Oh, so the Congregational Union of Australia was uh, the congregational denomination in Australia that stemmed from the Congregational Church in England as settlers migrated Uh there from Australia. So that church basically joined with the Presbyterians and the Methodists, or at least two groups of them, 
That's quite interesting. Those and, wily, wily Australian Methodists and Presbyterians. And, uh, and then our boy, Reverend Simon Hansford, is the uh, moderator-elect. Well, Jesse, thank you for joining us. Thank and, you for uh, having me. Yeah, sharing your, your story. Your first uh, special guest. Maybe our last. Who knows? <laughs> Hopefully one of many. Probably, uh, if you probably would like the first to, of many. Uh, If you would like to guest host an episode of Obscure Gummy, shoot us an email at... Uh, Obscuragami at gmail.com. Or visit us on the web at obscuragami.com. And check out the awesome show notes. Artwork by Matthew Flight. Uh, subscribe, leave a review in iTunes or wherever you uh, listen to the podcast. Send we're us, on YouTube. Send us some feedback. Yeah, we're on YouTube. You can subscribe, listen there. Send us money. Do you accept Courier Pigeon? We do. You do? Yes. Uh, Courier. Carrier pigeon, Keurig, Keurig pigeon, Keurig pigeons, uh, Keurig Are those K-cups. pigeons that bring you coffee? Uh, we accept uh, K cups and other uh, canned, Smoke and canned goods, Smoke Bitcoin, yeah. and Bitcoin Cash. Yeah, all the mm-hmm. major coins, mm-hmm. and and the obscure ones. Yeah, I do want to. I do want to talk about setting up a Patreon some at some point in the, in Ooh, the yeah. future for this endeavor, even if it's just for some milk money uh but who but knows we go through a lot of milk who knows the making of this show yeah yeah which milk i uh, mean cockroach milk mainly. mostly uh carrier i've pigeon switched milk. i've switched carrier over what? i've switched over to a blend of cockroach milk and and cashew milk mm. but at this point um oh so it's that's nice for you yeah it's a it's a it's a real nice um high high uh protein indeed hmm.